Today, we are talking about antibiotics, a group of drugs that have undoubtedly changed the landscape of human and animal medicine for the better. But is the miraculous power of these drugs waning? The World Health Organization has declared that AMR, antimicrobial resistance, ranks among the top 10 global public health threats. So it seems the alarm is sounding. In today's show, I'm speaking to Fergus Allerton, who is a highly respected figure in the veterinary world and who is a driving force in the fight against antibiotic resistance and is spearheading an upcoming antibiotic amnesty campaign, which is in its second year. Fergus, welcome to the consult room. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So we're going to get on to the amnesty campaign in a minute. But first, can we take a bit of a deep dive into the use of antibiotics in veterinary medicine? Can you explain the kind of the principles of how antibiotics work in animals and, and if it's any different to how they work in people? It, it really is no different. So vets like doctors have to make a prescribing decision every time they see uh, an animal patient. So if we feel that there is a bacterial infection, and that's the key part um, just like doctors, we want to make sure that we are treating something that would respond to antibiotics. So viral infections won't benefit from antibiotics, don't have antibiotics for them. And we have to make those same decisions every day as vets. We evaluate a patient, we decide that potentially they have a bacterial infection that could benefit from antibiotics, and then we make the same decision. And we use very similar drugs in the majority of situations so i remember when i first graduated as a vet and um obviously it's quite overwhelming sometimes when you think about the number of antibiotics that you've got to choose from well, we might talk a little bit about about why we've got such a, such a big range of them uh, but there's also the added complicating factor vets isn't they around the different species we've got to treat so do we have to i mean i, I should know the answer to this so this is more for people that are listening uh, but the vets have to consider not just the condition and the disease and the bug but also the species uh, that they're treating do different antibiotics work differently in different animals very much so it, not just in terms of their efficacy but also in terms of their side effects so there are certain medications or certain antibiotics that would be perfectly safe in humans or in dogs, but might cause significant side effects in cats, for example. So we have to be aware of all those complexities when making our prescribing decisions. Can you talk me through some of the potential side effects? In I mean, it's not just in species, is it? It's down even to specific breeds. I remember at vet school, you know, when they said, oh, you can never prescribe this type of antibiotic to this breed of dog because it causes this. And, you know, can you just talk me through some of those sort of uh, uh, side effects? Um, particular ones? Well, the one that I, I, I talk a lot about is the use of enrofloxacin in cats because that antibiotic can cause blindness and we can't always predict it. So if you use that inappropriately, um, e even um, when you think it might be the right antibiotic, it can cause very serious consequences in some animals. So that's one to avoid in cats wherever possible. And I think the one you were alluding to there was the um, use of potentiated sulfonamides in Dobermans, which can cause serious liver problems. So there are a few different um, antibiotic idiosyncrasies that we need to be aware of as vets. So you mentioned before that a vet's going to think about the animal that they're treating. They're going to think about the um, the type of uh, disease that they're treating as well. But then they've also got to think about uh, the type of antibiotic. So can you just talk through the different sort of types of antibiotic and, and what they kind of do? And Without trying to, without getting too technical, because we can go into all sorts of science here, but just give it a taste of, of, of what they are. So there are various different classes of antibiotics, often broken down by their mechanism of action. And that mechanism can dictate which type of bacteria they're most effective against. And so we can predict with a reasonable degree of confidence, which bacteria we might encounter in different environments. So the ones that we find on skin, causing skin infections, may be different from those that we find in the gut or in our bladders, for example. So we want to choose an antibiotic that is effective against the type of, anti of bacteria we're likely to find in certain sites. 
we also have to consider whether the antibiotic can get to where we're treating. So some antibiotics will concentrate nicely in the urine and treat a urine infection very well, but they won't penetrate tissue. So if you've got a problem in the prostate, they wouldn't reach it. So we have to think of all those um, aspects when making those decisions. But a new aspect that we really need to bear in mind is the antibiotic tier. And there are various groups that have categorized antibiotics according to their critical priority. So how important are these antibiotics for human use? And we need to be aware of that because we want to try and choose the antibiotics of the lowest tier, the ones that are going to have the smallest impact if bacteria became resistant to them. I think um, I remember actually when I uh, started working at a hospital in southeast London and there was about 10 vets that worked there. And and um, and I think you've been part of this um this this drive as well but we we it was this protect me uh kind of poster that we that we got we had to discuss what kind of antibiotics we we're going to use for certain conditions and it led to some really interesting conversations and there was a lot of vets there that had been working in practice for many many years and had got into the habit of oh that's antibiotic you prescribe for this because they'd seen uh good results and i'll give you a really good example which is you know where you had a uh, kind of uh, acute uh, bloody diarrhea which is quite common you get that quite a lot in uh in veterinary practice and uh you know it, it felt like the rhythm of practice had gone to or you always prescribe antibiotics for that and something like metronidazole was the one that you know was the classic one and it was only after we had this um really big discussion about all the conditions and our, our intention was to get all 10 vets to the same place of prescribing the right things for the right bug and the right condition and it was a really big piece of work and i remember just thinking god imagine trying to do this across the whole profession which is kind of you know your problem not mine uh, but I remember trying to do it for those 10 vets but there's this thing isn't there where people might have had some success in the past so they think well that's probably the right thing and then somebody tells somebody else and I'm sure human doctors have this as well that all of a sudden it just becomes a pattern of prescribing behavior but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the it's the right one does it so how do you get get it challenge that I mean obviously that 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 Postie creator was fantastic because it made us all think about it. We had to sign up to it, if I remember. You had to sign, this is what we're going to prescribe for this condition because this is the evidence behind it. But how do you go about that, doing that across a whole profession? Because I tried to do it with 10 vets and it was so, such a long-winded process. Well, uh, it, next month, Protect Me, the new version will come out. So we're really looking forward to that. We've just completed that process of reviewing those guidelines. And we've had 55 vets involved in that process. And you're right, it does generate a lot of discussions, a lot of gentle and friendly disagreements as to what the best choice is. But increasingly, we're becoming anti-antibiotic, where we don't need to use them, where their evidence supporting a clinical benefit is questionable. And you highlighted one that some, there's been some fantastic work done by Stefan Unterer's group over in, um, well, it, it initially in um, Germany and then in Zurich. And they've been studying this hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome. And you're right, people did use a lot of metronidazole for it, but there's no evidence it makes any difference. Dogs get better just as quickly without antibiotics as they do with metronidazole. So our latest recommendations are no antibiotics for acute diarrhea, even if it's got blood in it, unless that animal is showing signs of sepsis. And that's there's as good an evidence base for that recommendation as, the, as there is for anything in veterinary medicine. And increasingly, we can see some negative effects. And we talked earlier about some negative effects. Metronidazole causes a marked distortion, a disturbance in the bacterial population in our guts. So we all have, we talk about friendly bacteria, don't we, that help support our host's health. Well, metronidazole can damage that population and cause sustained problems with our microbiome. So I'm, I'm not in favour of using it. I don't think it's a benign choice. And I'd encourage vets to, to follow the Protect Me guidance and avoid antibiotics in that context. It's really interesting, that isn't it? Because I think that used to be one of the markers, wasn't it? So diarrhea, yeah, most people are comfortable not using antibiotics. Once there's blood there, 
everybody goes into a bit of panic state. And by everybody, I mean specifically owners. And I remember working um, at practice where we had quite a lot of uh, a lot of this. And owners would phone up specifically on the phone and say, I'd like to come and pick up some antibiotics, please, because I've got there's blood in my dog's diarrhea. And from the whole phone call right through to the concert room, that's what they well, that's what the owners were very clear they wanted. It was very difficult as a vet to have that conversation you just had. I just said, actually, there's no evidence to say this will help when their dog's there passing quite a lot of blood and looking really quite sorry for themselves. But I just wonder if there's a lot of in the human world, there's a lot of stuff now, isn't there, about healthy gut microbiomes. And what you just said there would have been a really good supporting conversation for a vet, wouldn't it? Saying, well, OK, we could give this antibiotic, but it's going to knock out all that good stuff in your in your dog's gut. And people might understand a little bit more. But I found that owner pressure you know, in my career has been quite a challenge to get over, even when you've got evidence in, in your back pocket. And you're right. And this is something that vets cite a lot. Vets always point the finger at owners and they say, I wouldn't have given antibiotics, but the owner made me. They, they held me over a barrel and forced me to make this prescription. I think that's a disservice to owners because I think owners are much further ahead than we think. And they are hearing these messages. They go to the doctors and they get told you don't need antibiotics for your cough. They watch I'm a Celebrity. And during the advert breaks, they see these little dancing antibiotics, keep antibiotics working and don't use antibiotics when they're not needed. So I think it's a perceived pressure. I think that vets do feel that it's an expectation of the owners. But I think if we start having frank conversations and saying your dog would be better off without antibiotics, I think we might be surprised how often owners are on side with this. And there are two tools that we have to try and help this. One is the non-prescription form. So you might go in, meet your vet, and after careful examination, they will make a decision not to use an antibiotic. And they'll give you a piece of paper instead that reaffirms why they've made that decision and what alternatives might be appropriate to get your animal better. And the second tool is a little animation video that we produced last year um, that vets are welcome to put on and have in their waiting room. It just raises awareness about AMR and it encourages owners to, to follow their vet's advice and try and avoid asking for antibiotics um, unless everyone agrees that it's essential to improve the quality and health of that patient. So I think um, I think yeah the, the the message that's drifting across from human medicine and also the message that you know um, people like yourself are deriving in in veterinary medicine is you know use less antibiotics, but there is something also as well, isn't there, around if you have been prescribed antibiotics for a specific reason that it's important to complete the full course, isn't it? And that's can you just explain why that's important as well? Because that's that's almost some people might because of that two conflicting messages well it it, it is important but it, it's something that's being increasingly questioned in human medicine so i'd love to say that all our course durations are evidence-based and that people can say that for that particular infection you need a seven-day course and for the next one you needed a five-day course but actually these numbers are arbitrary they're largely based on packet size on the number of fingers we have on our hands on the number of days there are in a week rather than any property of the bacteria we're targeting. So we, we do believe that we should complete the course and we need to inform doctors and vets as to what that optimal course duration is. Because we don't want to undertreat. If we undertreat, we can risk recurrence of the disease process and that infection coming back and causing illness again. And we certainly don't want to overtreat because that will lead to unnecessary antibiotic use um, as well. So it's finding that perfect medium um, of what is an ideal antibiotic course. That's really interesting. So there's probably a bit of watch this space then, isn't there, on a lot of these prescription lengths and, and how long we're giving antibiotics for? Yep. So let's talk about the um, antibiotic amnesty campaign then. What's the primary goal of this campaign? Well, I think there's two really big goals. Um, what we do know, and this is some great research that was done by um, human medics, is that people, when they do have 
some antibiotic courses, they don't always finish them. Sometimes you take an antibiotic and it makes you feel sick, worse than you were with, with whatever had that gave you reason to take them in the first place. So people will put them aside and say, I'm not taking those. They, they don't agree with me. Or um, pets may not may die during the course they may get better during the course there's various reasons it may be if you've got a cat it's impossible to get the tablets into them so they end up sitting on the side so we know that leftover antibiotics do occur and what we wanted to try and address is the way people dispose of them because if they just throw them out into household waste or down the toilet, it leads to environmental pollution and also can damage our watercourses. It can change those um, ecosystems and it can perpetuate this problem of antimicrobial resistance. So we want to avoid that. The second problem that they can do is that they'll hold on to them and think that they are vets. And they will say, right, I'm going to use that the next time my dog gets unwell. But that can cause real problems because it can cause unanticipated side effects. It can delay us reaching the right diagnosis to actually help that animal. And so we really, really must discourage that type of behavior. I understand it. I think you pay a lot for some of these drugs and you think, well, they might be useful. But please don't use them. That can cause all sorts of adverse effects. So going back to that environmental contamination piece, because that's a bit of a hot topic, isn't it, in, in, in the veterinary industry at the moment, specifically around uh, parasiticides and uh, what um, the consequences of them uh, leaching into the environment and the effect on our kind of natural um, order and the environment. So can you explain to me how antibiotics leaking into the environment can, can cause a problem to our uh, natural world? Well, uh, unfortunately, there is evidence that um, there are antibiotic residues in rivers on every continent on the planet now. And that is partly due to us taking antibiotics and then passing through us, which is normal. Um, but it will be contributed to by inappropriate disposal of unused antibiotics. And if that does happen, bacteria in the environment will be exposed to those low concentrations of antibiotics and may develop, will be selecting for resistant strains. And then those resistant strains might come back and get us um, if we then get infected by bacteria from the environment. So it's that cycle, isn't it, that we, we are putting antibiotics into an environment that we might then be exposed to um, in the future and we might end up with resistant bacteria that can be a real challenge to treat um, in the future. So what would be the um, worst case scenario out of this in terms of this antibiotic resistance developing? If we fast forward uh, a few decades and we haven't got control over this leakage into the environment and the increased residues what could potentially happen as a result of this this is apocalyptic and um dame sally davis likened the challenge from uh, antimicrobial resistance to that of climate change we're all familiar with the climate changes on every news bulletin you watch these days but amr could be of similar magnitude. Lord Jim O'Neill did a brilliant study back in 2016 where he anticipated that by 2050, so within a generation, we could be looking at 10 million people dying per year due to multi-drug resistant infections. Um, and already in 2019, over 1 million people's deaths was directly attributed to multi-drug resistant infections. It could block us being able to do chemotherapy. So cancer patients would be deprived of that life-saving therapy. It could stop us having hip replacements, knee replacements, because you just wouldn't be able to protect any surgical site infection. And they would be catastrophic. They would be either life-threatening or limb-threatening procedures. So this has massive ramifications for human and for animal health. So that's pretty scary, I would say. And we're going to get on to 
the actions that we're asking people to do in a minute to prevent what you've just described, which nobody really wants. But I just wanted to uh, talk about a couple of um, uh, scenarios that have happened over my veterinary career, and it's happened quite a few times. And I just wondered if you could explain them for me a little bit. So um, we have uh, often had animals in with uh, wounds uh, that haven't necessarily been healing in the right way. And you take a swab uh, of the wound and send it away. And uh, sometimes you end up uh, back with something that looks like or is what's considered a uh, an MRSA. So I've often been in the situation where you've had to deal with this um, and I'll get you to explain what MRSA actually is for everybody. Um, but often you'll find there's a link with that animal when you do a, a bit of digging around and ask about its background and things like that. There's often a link with that pet and then somebody that's been in hospital in the family. Um, and that's happened to me on a couple of occasions. And I just wondered if you'd come across that and if that was a common thing. But first of all, could you explain what MRSA is and if it is in the context of what we're talking about? And then secondly, if we're already seeing um seeing links between uh people and animals in in hospital and veterinary situations that's a, a really interesting question and one that we could take us all afternoon to to deal with but mrsa um the first two well the last two letters staph aureus um is a common um, more human pathogen um than um canine but we do find staph aureus or in many surfaces, probably on our hands, um, up our noses. And Staph aureus can, unfortunately, develop resistance to a group of antibiotics called the beta-lactams. This is a group that includes penicillins. And that resistance is carried by a particular gene. And we can test for it by testing the, the resistance of that bacteria to an antibiotic called methicillin. So it's methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, MRSA. Now, we actually see Staph pseudintermedius, which is, if you like, the canine equivalent of Staph aureus. So we see Staph pseudintermedius. So we talk more about MRSP than MRSA. And you, you highlighted a situation that does unfortunately occur because we share bacteria with our with the animals in our household. And that can apply to sensitive or susceptible strains and resistant strains. And that can have serious health implications. So if your dog has multi-resistant drug um, infections, in particular, if it has MRSP or MRSA, that can be transferred to you, but equally, you could be the vector to contaminate your dog. And if this dog had a perfectly sterile surgery performed and has a, a wound over its knee, actually the MRSA could be coming from your nose um, or my nose rather than um, a, a direct canine contaminant. So we demonstrating the direction of transfer of these bacteria is often very, very difficult. So just really kind of what you were saying there really highlighted to me that this obviously is a um, is a, a, a global problem, but it's a, a human health and a, a, an animal health kind of collaborative problem, isn't it? So is there collaboration happening between um, human and veterinary or, or animal health uh, spheres? And what does that look like? Very much. This is a one health problem and we're all in this together. And I think that we want to, there's no point us working in little silos on our own. We want to share those resources, share what works and try and incorporate those strategies into different practices. So the antibiotic amnesty actually came from NHS Midlands and a brilliant group working here um, involving Connor Jameson and Raki Agarwal. They came up with this idea and they ran it very successfully in 2021 and it was only last year that we um, jumped on the bandwagon so to speak from a veterinary perspective but we can make exactly the same arguments as they can in human health to try and get these leftover antibiotics back into practices so that they can be disposed of safely. 
So let's get on to the specific actions then, because I think you just you mentioned one there. So what are we actually asking people and vets to do as part of this amnesty? Well, we're asking vets to make the, to facilitate this process, which is actually something all vet practices do already. So if you have leftover antibiotics or leftover pharmaceutics of any nature, you should return them to your vet practice for safe disposal. Don't put them into household waste. Don't throw them into the toilet and don't keep them for future reuse. You should return them to that. So your vets are already set up to do this. We would love it if during the month of November, particularly for antibiotics, they can have a dedicated in so that they can record how much antibiotics they get back, just so that we can audit the success of this um, process. But what we're asking owners to do is have a look in those cupboards. What have you got left over? What have you not completed that course because Fluffy got better? Um, and can you return those antibiotics back to your practice? And if you've got any of your own antibiotics lying around, take them back to your local pharmacy because they will also dispose of them safely. And I think for me, the other main benefit of the amnesty is greater awareness. If people are thinking, I am going to go and check my cupboard because I don't want these antibiotics to get into the environment, they're thinking about the bigger picture. They're recognising what can be done, a small step. We all have to work together on this one, making small changes to combat the risk from antimicrobial resistance. If everyone does their little bit, like recycling, like not you using a plastic bag each time we go to the shops, we can make that difference together. And for anybody that's listening uh, who is thinking, OK, um, get it, not going to throw them in, in my bin, understand that, you know, there's this um, risk of environmental residues and all the problems that causes just to give them confidence on what the vets are going to do with them because I know some of you might be thinking well the vet's not just going to throw them in the bin uh, so just talk me through how vets are disposing of these medicines. Well we have very dedicated and very specific disposal routes available to us and we we do not and no vet will resell or reuse any of these products okay they they I can guarantee that they will all go through safe disposal um, means. And this is identical. They actually have a slightly different code on the um, drug bin to human ones, but they go to the same place and they get handled in exactly the same way as human drug waste does. So these are what we are really ensuring is that the antibiotic will never, ever contaminate and pollute the environment. And so it won't contribute to worsening of AMR. It will be safely disposed of to protect us all. Are there any specific guidelines or regulations for disposal of antibiotics in different regions or countries? What I'm kind of getting at is, is, is all the countries around the world, are they aligned in this or, or are we kind of leading the way? Um. I can't claim that we're leading the way, but I think that there is a whole range of different um, approaches across the world, um, both to antibiotic sale, um, and there are countries where you can go to a pharmacy and buy antibiotics over the counter, but there are also different uh, availability of these um, disposal routes. I think in lots of countries in Europe and in North America, the antibiotic amnesty has value and you can be re reassured that these routes will be um, exactly what you expect in terms of disposal. Actually, WSAVA are going to um, embrace the amnesty and it's going to be part of our output next year is to try and take this amnesty globally and to invite different countries to also try and ensure the safe disposal of antibiotics where they are too. So, we're encouraging anyone listening around the world to adopt these policies. I think they, they apply wherever, but local situations may vary. So I'm going to kind of try and summarise what I think um, is meant by this phrase that you hear quite a lot, which is antibiotic stewardship. And that's kind of this uh, safe and responsible use of, of antibiotics and things. But but what I'm hearing from our conversation, and correct me on this, um, if I was going to summarise it, is that 
if we were going to um, have responsible antibiotic stewardship, it would involve prescribing less or prescribing only when needed. Uh, it would be um, the uh, appropriate kind of administration of these antibiotics in line with how they've been prescribed by, by an owner. Um, and then it would be safe disposal of unwanted or unused medicines. Is there anything else that you would add to that as a summary of, of how we would manage this in the best way possible? No, I think that's a great summary. And I think that until now, that disposal part has been the missing link. And that's where the amnesty hopefully fills that gap and ensures that guardianship is complete right from the process of making that prescribing decision through to the end of life, if you like, of that antibiotic drug itself. It's either going into an animal to treat a known bacterial infection or it's going back to the vets so it can be disposed of appropriately. Thank you for your time today, Fergus. This is a hugely important topic and the consequences of us not acting now could be huge, especially on human and animal health as well. Um, so where can people go to find out more information about this at Amnesty? So the rumour companion animal and equine pages have a lot of useful information. This is hopefully every resource you could possibly need. Um, there's all sorts of animations, there's posters, there's um, information for um, newsletters. We have tried to make this as easy as possible for practices to get involved in. And we hope that this information can be um, disseminated as widely as possible and as easily as possible to make this a low input, high output project. And for pet owners who are also interested in finding out more, whereabouts do they go? Same place. Um, the Rumour Companion Animal and Equine website has resources there for uh, owners too. And hopefully, uh, I'm sure they can encourage their vet practices to get on board if they aren't already. Brilliant. Thank you, Fergus. And thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you very much indeed.